So uh, what we're going to try to do is help you understand a definition of a master's trained salesperson. First of all, a master's trained salesperson never does anything to anyone. They only do something for or with someone. As we get through the discussion today, I plan to um, kind of help you see where the process that we've used in many service companies, but here, since this is a collision repair audience, we actually become part of the problem. I remember when my son came home from college, uh, freshman year, uh, 18 years old, um, and he's hanging around the office and we're going to go to lunch together and talk about things that have been going on. He kind of stands there and he says, you know, Dad, I think we're part of the problem around here instead of part of the solution. And, you know, I, I, I immediately got defensive. I mean, I didn't say much to him, but I'm thinking, who is this kid, snot-nosed brat, coming back to a body shop that he's hardly worked in and telling his dad, who is <laughs> Dave Dunn, after all, <laughs> that we were part of the problem. But as we talked over lunch and we, and, and we visited and revisited some of the, some of the systems we were asking our customers to, and, and hoops to jump through, he was right. We were, we were actually part of the problem. We were asking people to serve our systems rather than having our systems serve the people. What's the first thing they typically say when they walk into a collision repair shop? I need, I need an estimate, right. How many of you believe that it's even true that they need an estimate? Do they? Could you just fix their car for them? Yeah. Sure you could. They might need something at some point in time to get started, but in the truest sense, they really don't need an estimate. What does your customer need, though? They need you to make their problem go away, and that's a lot more than just some document. You know, they need you to do something for or with them as a true salesperson. Oftentimes, we're hesitant to call ourselves salespeople because we don't want to appear to be in that group of stereotypical salespeople that do something dishonorable with the customer. That's not us. I need another direct repair relationship. You know, I need somebody else to steer work to me. Rob alluded to this in his opening remarks when he said that maybe selling in the automotive business like we're in has become a bit of a lost art, and that may be because many of our shops have relied on direct repairs where we think we're sort of entitled to the work because there's some contractual obligation for the insurance company to recommend us. We think that's a very slippery slope. With collision repair, I believe that the moves that we've made have created transactional buyers, people who at their core would prefer to be relational, but by our own behavior as sale, sales people and marketers, we've turned them into transactional thinkers. We don't allow the relational buyer anywhere to land. Here's one, I can't afford to make this insurance adjuster mad because they represent such a large part of my business. Somehow believing that if you continually cave in and you continually take less payment than what you deserve on the car, worse yet, your employees get thrown under the bus because you don't write a good enough estimate where they're fairly compensated and somehow we think that's going to create loyalty with these big organizations. We never believe that you should ask for more than you have coming, but you really owe it to everybody within the organization to make sure that we're fairly compensated for what we're doing to the vehicle. We need to develop this thing called TSA. It's an acronym, Total Sales Attitude. It exists when it becomes evident that everyone in an organization will do whatever is reasonable to get your business. You can just tell when you're in a TSA-driven organization. You know, they, they just get it. It's like people want you to be there. I mean, you had the opposite experience a lot lately. Speaking of salesmanship being a dying art, how many times you go to a big box store, they've run big ginormous ads, perhaps in the newspaper or maybe advertised on the television or radio and tried to get you there, only to find that there's a sales apathy that you could cut with a knife. You walk in and say, if you can get somebody to wait on you, they say something like, can I help you? And they go, yeah, I'm thinking about buying one of these TVs that you guys have advertised. Okay, well, TVs are over there. I mean, there is a sales apathy. One of the pieces of research I learned a number of years ago, it's an old slide that's been around for a long time, it's like, why is it that customers quit? Why do customers start doing business with, say, like a, a service company like yours? Maybe it's an insurance agency, uh, could be a healthcare agency, it could be a, a, an auto repair shop. 
Why is it that at one time they did business with you and now they no longer do business with you? Well, statistically, here's what it says. It says, well, now this is really quitting right here. One percent of them quit everything. Not just you, don't take it personally. <laughs> Three percent move away, there's nothing you can do about that. And here's another one you can't do anything about. Five percent friendships elsewhere. I promise you this, if someone has a friendship elsewhere, they're not a prospect for you. They may have been a prospect at one time or a customer, but if they develop a friendship elsewhere, they'll go there. Competitive reasons, that means price. Less than one out of 10, actually, leave for price. 14% quit because of product dissatisfaction, but 68% quit because of an attitude of indifference toward the customer by some employee. Now, this is kind of interesting stuff, because if you go back to the red sign, it says, if mediocrity is a perception of what you do, then price is the only differentiator. You know, in other words, if you're going to give me apathetic service, and you're going to give me apathetic service, I want it at a really good price. <laughs> I don't want to pay a lot for apathetic service. We have to figure out ways to overcome some of our limiting beliefs. For instance, understanding what the customer really wants and needs. We know we talked about this at the very beginning. We said. Uh, how many of you believe that the customer really needs an estimate? Most of you agree. Well, no, not really. And yet, think about how we set up our entire process. Customer walks in. Now, you are very aware that they don't really need an estimate, but the customer just knows kind of the, the word track that they've been taught. Well, you need to go out and get a couple of estimates on a car. That's very common for them to believe that. Sometimes the insurance industry kind of encourages them to do that, even though they know it's unnecessary. Customer walks in and says, I need an estimate. Now you, the person who actually understands the customer's wants and needs, know very well that it's not in its truest sense true that they need an estimate. But what do you do? You build your entire process around the wrong premise that they need an estimate to start with. How nutty is that? In other words, now, I learned this from Zig Ziglar years ago. He said this. He said, in every situation in life, in every conversation in life, there's a buyer and there's a seller. You have just become the buyer when you should be in the position of a seller. You have bought a wrong premise and now started to build an entire process around the wrong premise that they need an estimate to start with. 